Lauren Dockett, Senior Writer for Psychotherapy Networker Magazine. Very pleased to be here today with Elaine miller Karras. Welcome, Elaine. Uh, thank you so much. I'm so honored to be here with you, Lauren. Elaine's uh, written a recent story for us, and that is entitled Wartime Trauma Treatments on the website now. You can go to psychotherapynetworker.org if you haven't already read it. Um, and before we get started, we welcome you to check in. Go ahead and check in in the messages. Let us know where you're joining us from. That'll also be the place where you can take a question. Where, I mean, you can ask a question, excuse me. We'll take your questions um, and make a comment as we go along. If you're not already a subscriber to the magazine, joining today entitles you to a significant discount. So just use the link psychotherapynetworker.org forward slash Elaine, spelled E-L-A-I-N-E. Okay, oh my good. gosh, people get a discount for listening. Just oh for my listening. gosh. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a deal, Lauren. <laughs> it's a deal. Um, all right, so let's get started. Elaine is a social worker. She is a trauma therapist, and she is co-founder and director of innovation at the Trauma Resource Institute. She's also a radio host and author of Building Resiliency to Trauma, the Trauma and Community Resiliency Models which has been selected by the United Nations Library as one of the innovations that can help them meet their sustainable development goals. Such an interesting honor there, Elaine. Yes, um, it was. The modern yeah. model has been introduced to over a hundred countries to help heal the wounds of conflict and war and to treat PTSD. It is designed to reset the nervous system, and positively impact depression, anxiety, PTSD, secondary traumatic stress and resilience. And right now, everybody, as we speak, Elaine and her coworkers are doing something extraordinary. They are actively working with Ukrainian war trauma survivors, not just post-trauma, but in the midst of the ongoing war. So Elaine, let's start there. Let's start with why, why you decided to take this leap. Well, yep, go ahead. You know, I think many of us know it's about relationship, relationship, relationship when we do our projects, whether we work individually or we, look, we work collaboratively in communities. So in 2019, I was invited to go to New Delhi um, by the uh, C Learning Program from Emory University. C stands for Social, Emotional, and Ethical Learning. And it was inspired by His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And it is an educational program, which is free. Of, I went, oh, I hope everybody goes up there and looks at it at Emory University because it's a free curriculum for kindergarten through 12. And it is based on wanting to help the world's children learn about how to be compassionate and ethical beings. And I was so honored to be a senior consultant because the community resiliency model has been integrated as chapter two of that curriculum. So when I was in New Delhi, there was a delegation from Ukraine led by Alexander Elkin, who's now become a dear colleague and a friend. And so he said to me when I was in New Delhi, he said, Elaine, you must come to the Ukraine. And I said, I've never thought about coming to the Ukraine, Alexander, tell me why. So they were going to have a launch of sea learning in um, um, Kharkiv. And he wanted to be what he went, asked me to be one of the keynote presenters. And so through, you know, you know, a longer story that I have here to tell is that I ended up going to Kharkiv in the fall of 2019. And of course, when you go to a country and you meet the people and you you meet the teachers because um, he's in charge and he inspired Ed Camp Ukraine, a network of 35,000 teachers that have their wonderful children of Ukraine in their hands for learning and lessons. Um, you may hear some dogs in the background and hopefully they will be quiet soon. But in any event, um, when I went there, I met so many wonderful people that are dedicated to creating compassionate, empathic networks. Um, and I fell in love with them. What can I say? So over the last few years since being in Kharkiv, I've, I've been a consultant to EdCamp. So I've, I've presented at some of their conference, of course, on uh, digital learning platforms. And coincidentally, the day, February 24th, the day the war started, we were scheduled for a meeting to talk about launching the Community Resiliency Model Teacher Training Program in Ukraine. So we did a quick pivot and I said, Alexander, what can we do to help? He said, could you provide a series of webinars for us so that we can teach the wellness skills of the Community Resiliency Model that they knew well already through the C Learning Project, but that was directed towards children. This would be bringing it to the audience of adults and also opening it up to their network and their connections through social media. 
So we said, okay, we're there. So we actually were able to get um, Ukrainian translators to translate our materials. So we had the PowerPoints ready on the February 25th. And on February 25th, 26th, 27th, and 28th, we did um, uh, one and a half hour webinars, which you can actually, any one of the listeners can go on Ed Camp Ukraine's Facebook page and actually see what we, we, we offered. And so then, so then it was just, it was like the relationships were there. We had the relationships to do the translations. They knew the model could be helpful because the model is about nervous system regulation. And if we are in hyper or hypo arousal, there's very simple skills that many of the listeners here kind of, oh, I know those skills. I do that already. But we put it into a little menu, really, um, that makes it very accessible and adaptable Mm -hmm. and transportable, that we can do it online, which, of course, we learned because of the horror of the pandemic when we all had to switch to doing things digitally. So that's how it happens so quickly. And then there's one more piece in that after the the fourth webinar, Alexander said, he goes, Elaine, we need this kind of support every day. Could you do resiliency meetings for us? And we said, okay, we're going to, we're going to muster our international uh, community through the Trauma Resource Institute and we'll do it every day. So as if, as of June 10th, that's the last time I have statistics, we have met 67 times. Oh, um, and we met every day initially, then we went to three days and now we're going to two days a week. Um, and it has been really a sacred privilege for us to be responding during the crisis because we've responded to many things after, yeah. but actually to be there. During the crisis. And so just walk me through it for a second. So you're going in every day and there are two co-facilitators. Does anybody? See? Well, so that's a great question. So basically we have a number of community resiliency model teachers um, that are certified through our program, through the Trauma Resource Institute, but we also have a number of uh, trauma resiliency model practitioners, which is a somatic body-based model. So people like we're saying, how can we help? So we had, I think we had over 150 people wanting to volunteer. So we set up a rotating volunteer process. So we may have online at any one time, we could have up to seven or eight different um, volunteers from our organization. And what makes that really, uh, I think, uh, supportive and also helpful is that we meet a half an hour before we go online for the hour and they are now sending questions. So then we as a team can talk about how would we respond to these questions from the multitude of different um, modalities that we're we're trained in because we're not only trained in a somatic based model like the trauma resiliency model. I imagine some of the listeners are trained in somatic experiencing or sensory motor psychotherapy, but we're also trained in, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy and uh, psychodynamics so that we bring in all of our skills to respond to the questions. And then we also have some Ukrainian therapists that come now. Mm -hmm. And so we always are so humbled to have them there and say, do you have anything you want to add from your experience? And so then it becomes you know, really this kind of uh, cross Atlantic, um, uh, really collaboration. Collaboration. What, and what kind of questions are you getting? Oh right my now? gosh. You know what? I actually, uh, knowing I was going to come, I actually had my, one of my staff members, uh, I said, you know, can you just kind of do something and give me all the questions and I can, I can tell you a few of them. So, um, cause there's like 40, so I'm sure you don't want to hear all of them, but, um, <laughs> How do you manage these feelings of inner emptiness when you're not home and don't know when you might return, when you have no energy to take root in a foreign country or learn, or learn a new language when you're almost 50? Um, supporting pregnant women when so much is uncertain, is it moral to bring a baby into the world yeah. during these uncertain times? I fled to Portugal with my kid. We don't know anyone here. My son is nine. Recently he asked me to get him a toy so that he could have a friend. He only meets his friends online. He really lacks communication because I have not yet got him into school here. My heart is breaking. How do I support him? I'm so terrified of being raped and tortured. How do I deal with this? Um, I think one of the, you know, I'm, I, there's 40 of them. I think you're getting the idea of what they're like, right? Right. And but- some people, Elaine, have left and some people are still in country. That's right. So we get both. And so like a question, you know, one of the the questions that really struck me to the heart is one of the uh, participants um, asked, she said, I was just standing in a food line. 
there was an explosion and half of the people in the line were killed. Oh my God. I escaped. I'm going, as I go back to the bunker, how do I be with my children and my elderly parents and not show them my terror and fear and support myself and them at the same time? Mm-hmm. I mean, so I hope that the listeners are hearing that those kinds of questions we may have had to answer after, but now we're saying, in, and I think the amount of support that we've been able to, you know, we didn't know when we were starting. Of course, a- Alexander asked us to do this, but then he started telling us about the numbers of people listening. And I want to just share with you all, because I think that for all of us that are therapists, for me, this was a paradigm shift. If we can do this in Ukraine, that when there is any conflict in our world, why couldn't we create something similarly? If people can have access to the internet, which you might imagine that is hard for some people in Ukraine right now in the areas that are being shelled. But even then, because of what um, Elon Musk did in terms of internet access, many of them have had internet access that maybe in times past they wouldn't have had. Mm -hmm. I, I think that when we can respond to those questions in real time, we're providing an element of support. So the last statistic that I had, there were over 30,000 live views to our broadcast and 57,000 um, people who had viewed, we don't know how many people those actually are, but I can say 57,000 views after the fact on their Ed Camp Ukraine Facebook page and then on their YouTube channel. So they're using both platforms now. Mm-hmm. So, as you can imagine, if we, and so what they're doing now is they're chron- chronicling the shows that we've done. Some of them have been dealing with panic attacks and you can imagine how common that would be right Right. so if they're dealing with panic attacks now they're chronicling the show so people can go into the archive and they can listen to a show that had to do with panic attacks and that's one of the reasons why now we can go from meeting every day to meeting two times um, a week because now they have the archive shows that we can we can actually let people know exist as well as what the new questions may be and i have to tell you the questions are changing because in the in the beginning of the war, there was, okay, this is going to be a short war. We just have to get through. And now we're over three months in, right. close to four months in, right? So now it's like, oh, when is this going to be over? Do I have the stamina to keep up my hope, right? right. And this, it's the human nature to be wavering and that we can also be there for, the, for when that happens. Because, of course, we think that's organically sound to have those kinds of responses. And we can be there. And not only feel the questions, but also bring in some of the body-centered wellness skills that can help Mm -hmm. bring people to the present moment. And we often say, you know, what else is true? Um, Elaine, for the people who are still in country, um, are they asking for help from other people on the call or from you to find a way out? Or are they they, they staying and looking they haven't story. they haven't done that and i think that's because ed camp ukraine is such a solid um charity within um ukraine and they have such broad connections what has happened and we're hoping to do some things differently and maybe some of your you know uh, listeners who may want to contact me i would invite them to do so we were contacted by a group that um that is from israel that is doing a, a kind of a truncated emdr that peer to peers can learn mm-hmm. and so we are going to try to arrange a meeting with them with him so that that possibly can be an additional offering because I I think that one of the things that we can do and I think that we're posed to do that because of the collaborations that we've made what are some other modalities that we can bring in to help them besides the one that we also think is very helpful but we all know as therapists not every modality works for every single person and also in the way that we're doing it, it has to be more of a since we don't know who's listening, right? It has to be more of the peer-to-peer kind and well-being skills because we obviously can't reprocess traumatic experiences because we're working with a whole array of different people. Although there have been people that have come on that I have done some work with that you could say could be in the trauma reprocessing thing that I've done in front of who knows how many people in the world that are listening that I know have helped people in the process. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about what you found yourself shifting as you work with people who are in the midst of this ongoing trauma. How does how does the work shift? What are you do, what 
What well, are you offering that's okay? That's so let me just say a little bit about um, the community resiliency model because it's just a set of very simple six wellness skills. The six wellness skills are based on the biology of the human nervous system and how we can bring our nervous system back into balance. We call it the zone of well being or the resilient zone. And, you know, in this resilient zone, it's not necessarily a calm space. It can, it can be. You can be angry and sad in this zone of well-being, but you feel you can manage what's happening to you. And then we can go into what we call the high zone or the low zone. High zone is like we're, you know, hyper arousal. We're distressed. We can't even think clearly. Our prefrontal cortex goes offline. Low zone states are similar, right? We become disconnected. You know, if we're using um, Porges' theory, we're in a deep dorsal dive, which we've certainly seen. Um, so we use very simple information about um, the neuroscience that many of us have learned and embrace about what happens to us when we experience traumatic experiences. Mm -hmm. And I've seen this after the fact that people feel very um, uh, sometimes relieved that what their experience isn't because they're quote unquote crazy, that's what how they might describe themselves, but they're having a common biological reaction to what's happening to them. Mm -hmm. And so we use that information. And so we might even bring up a couple of slides that explains the amygdala, that explains the appraisal system and how the survival response goes into play. Because people will have those same questions. Why did I run while other people stayed? That's a big question too. Why did I decide to stay in whatever city and my family ran to the border? Mm -hmm. and we can talk about survival responses in a biological way, mm -hmm. as well as you know the plethora of different reasons why people decide to leave when they've had those kinds of experiences. But I think that the other things that we've done, it's, it hasn't necessarily been different, but I've done this also after disasters. But sometimes we ask very simple questions. When did you know you had gotten away from that threat? Mm -hmm. when know you were safer. Those are actually resource questions because at that moment they're saying, oh, right, I remember I got to the bunker and I saw my children and I just ran to them and I held them. And so as you're remembering that moment of holding them, what do you notice happening in your body? And sometimes they'll start to cry. Crying's a good, crying's a good thing, right? And you can actually hear their parasympathetic breath and they'll say, oh, I feel lighter. So we track through, you know, the, the very important um, information we're learning about exterioception that, you know, the research that's being done shows that people who can um, read their nervous systems actually have better impulse control and affect regulation. So we're essentially teaching them to tell the difference between the sensations of distress and well-being and when they have those moments of respite, even in war, to bring attention to that. And there's plenty of moments like that that they share with us. Like one of our uh, persons that's a, a leader in ed camp went from Kharkiv to a safer part of Ukraine. And she told us that the journey was so um, um, touching to her because at every stop, train stop, there were villagers that would come with food to mm. feed the people that were on there. It makes me okay. cry thinking about it, right? Yeah. Those are great yeah, food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so those kinds of things we try to highlight to remember what else is true, because if you only talked about the suffering, and the suffering, of course, is part of the reason why we're there, but we also lean into the suffering, you know, they can express whatever they want to, and then we lean out with questions like I just said, when did you know you were safer? There's a lot of questions about their children. I was and gonna ask. Course, there are, are oh. yeah. So are so them to yes. help the kids along the way. So yeah, so so with the children, and since a lot of them are teachers, and some of them, like one of the questions I remember quite, uh, it was about a month or so ago, the school started again online, and one of the teachers said, all the kids want to talk about what they've seen, but then I can't get to my lessons. I don't know how much time to give to them and how much time to give to the lessons. So we did a, a little chat about, well, they may have to talk a little bit about it, but you also can intersect things that, you know, how did you get through? And is there a book that you're reading? Try to develop those resources in the children, because if you don't talk about it, then their prefrontal cortex may not be online to be able to pay attention to the lessons that she also is um, very motivated to teach the children. And since we have worked a lot in our organization, we're integrated into many schools, not only the C learning program, that we have had a lot of experience in working in areas where children are traumatized on a daily basis and you don't have to be living in war 
to I'm sure many people that are parts of the United States or they see someone from Pakistan that people have lived in those kinds of situations where that's going on to this day. Yeah. And that's and that's why I think you know and I but I want to say one I want to tell you one little story. So the person I said that had gone to Portugal. So we asked her if her son if there was the toy that her son wanted to get and she said well there is a toy that he wants to get and and so and by the way this is all through a Ukrainian translator when I'm asking these questions and she said he wants to get um a, like a stuffed animal of Yoda. And so many of you know that Yoda is one of the wise characters in Star Wars. And so I said to, said to her, I said, oh, my, the kind of mother you must be for your son to think of the wisest character. <laughs> this is my wow. name, right? The wisest character in Star Wars. And she said, oh, you're right. That is a wise character. And that was the friend he chose to pick from the all the different imaginary figures that we have in the room. And you could just hear her like sigh and feel so much better thinking about that wasn't really something that was wrong with her son. It was something right about him, mm -hmm. about thinking that would be the character of support besides his mom, mm -hmm. right? And you know that many, I think the other thing to, I want to just underscore that many people that are, have left to other countries, there are the, the mom with their children because the men over 18 can't leave. So that means there's, yeah, so many of, of the, some of the questions have been kind of related to this story as well is, I'm, you know, I'm upset with my husband because he's or my partner because he or they are not responding to me in the way that I thought they would. And maybe they need to try to find another job or, you know, the kinds of things that happen with couples anyway. But when there's a separation with war, um, but that story about that little boy, then the, the thing that we have that's lovely is people come back again and tell us, go, oh, he's doing better. I was able to find a Yoda for him in Portugal. And he started school and I, and I can see that he's doing better. And so then I asked the mom, well, well, how are you now that he's doing better? And she said, well, everything is not sorted out, but it's making me feel a little better, right? Mm -hmm. able to do that. So, I mean, it's organic what we're doing too, where it's not trying to, you know, have positive toxicity in the midst of war, but being real about the people that are in and the people that are in other parts of the, of the world. So I'm trying to imagine them all together on the same call. And that sort of, is there this sort of caretaking happening from one to the next? Well, I think what happens is that for some of us, see, so a lot of people, um, there's a few people that come on Zoom, but most people listen, so I don't see them. Don't see them. But for the people that come on Zoom, and that has fluctuated in numbers, right? Um, there is kind of this family that grows, that we we become concerned if someone's not, you know, oh, where did, what happened to them? They're not there. And so hoping that they'll come, if we know anybody on the call that said, well, you know what happened to Christina? And then someone says, well, I think she had to leave her city to go to another city. Because of course, we don't know who has listened to us that may not be alive any longer. Right. And that I think hits our, our, um, our tri volunteers very hard because of, I mean, honestly, Lauren, we're sometimes like talking like we're talking right now and you heard my dogs there a little bit ago. Sometimes we'll hear a siren. Yeah. And we'll hear an explosion. They'll say, gotta go. Yeah. And they leave for a while. And yeah. when they're gone, we don't know if they're going to come back or not. So let's, let's talk hard. about this. Yeah. Let's stay with this just for a second, Elaine. And I know you, you wrote about this in the story. But what happens when you are the professional in the room and you're, you're, you're nowhere near, but this, you know, normally this is not the case when you do PTSD work or you, you, you <laughs> fly in after the case, you know, you're there with these people, you're doing the work, it's continuing, you're forming relationships, there's the steadiness, but here you are in another country, other people elsewhere, not seeing these people come back or you're do sort of diving in for this hour or two and then, and then going back to your regular House. Lauren, it That's has been possible. it has been weird and strange. Yeah. Um, first of all, I think I want to say I, I I realize my advantage yeah. of being in a country that well, and I want to say that in a part of the U.S. that is not war torn because we know that many people live in inner cities where they they live with this kind of violence every single day yeah. of their life. So I feel my advantage in terms of that. But I have to say that there have been times when I've had wobbly feet that all the skills that I know to share with them, I share for myself. And that one day I heard the siren. I've been very, become very close to my translator. Her name is Natalia. And she was the one that had to leave. And I, I, I'm just thinking, oh, I hope she lives. You know, it's like those moments of like this thinking. 
yeah. about that. And then within five minutes, she was back and she was in the hallway of her home. I said, Natalia, are you sure you're safe? You know, we have other translators. She goes, no, I'm fine. And for her, it's like her, it's like a sacred mission that this is what she's providing to the people of Ukraine is being able to translate for us. But I think for myself, there was one day that I had to talk to someone who'd been on the calls, who's a, a very close friend and a psychologist. I said, Ron, I just need to, I need to talk to you. I need to debrief this because, you know, that question I said, are we doing, is this okay to do this? Yeah. You know, I think that any of us that are rational and, and ethical people going, are we doing the right thing? And it was talking to a, a young woman who, who um, I did write about her, who, you know, said, you know, my, my office has just been bombed. I'm with my family. There's no hope. And at the end of that call, she did seem a little bit better, but not, of course, completely better. How could she be? Mm -hmm. But then she was the one that came a couple days later and all of a sudden, you know, un <laughs> unmuted herself and started singing Ukrainian hymn and said she thought it was impossible that she could actually experience hope in the midst of war. So then I thought, OK, that was but I have to tell you, in between that time, had my my doubts about are we doing the right thing and and just feeling wobbly about um wishing i could do more right and and that kind of that kind of moral dilemma between privilege and suffering and for me it's the reality that we are a very small world and because i have traveled so much internationally you know when things happen to other people in other parts of the world i do feel like it happens to me and my and my family now which is a is an odd place to be. So yeah, it has been hard, but we have a debriefing. I okay. want you all to know that after we have the hour um, conversation, we debrief as a team and people are able to talk about their emotions, their feelings. If they feel like maybe we should have done this differently next time, do we need to do something? You know, kind of doing a constructive feedback, but also being able to express our feelings and, our, and emotions. And what are you hearing in those? In those well, areas? so I, it's a whole range of things, of feeling the suffering, but also, and this may sound strange to some of your listeners, but also there's a, a lot of hope and resilience, well-being that we also hear from them. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes we leave there and saying, I just feel so honored that they have opened up their hearts and their minds, their emotions to us, and we're able to offer this this small bit of, of, of respite. So I think I hear that mostly because mm -hmm. um, they tell us that. Like we were talking about historical trauma, for example, and you know that Ukraine is in a place in the world where, you know, many people, they've lived through World War I. There's still survivors of World War II that are alive, right? Mm -hmm. um, they've had, they had a great famine and now they have this. And one of the, our, our colleagues, from Ukraine, from Ed Camp, her name is Anna, thinks she's one of the wisest people I've ever met in the world. She said, well, Elaine, I was talking to my daughter. She says, I never imagined that we would also experience what my parents, what my grandparents, but when we think about historical trauma, I think about the, also my family, they're strong and they have strength because they made it through <laughs> World War I, World War II, the famine, and now, now, and now this. And she says, I believe my daughter will tell her daughter about what we're living through now. Now that gives me a chill just repeating it to you, Lauren, because right. we hear that too. And she goes, and Ukrainians have strong DNA. How could you not like feel that? Right. And yeah. she felt, I mean, you could see her light up when she said that, because I think that's also, and we've seen with Ukrainian people, of, of course, there's great suffering and loss, but we've also seen that. And we've also seen, which I think is really interesting, is asking us questions about the future. Well, what do you recommend as, as soldiers come back to the front? And we have, they always say, and we are victorious. Yeah. And we have our victory. And how do we help the soldiers? How do we help those that have seen unspeakable atrocities? And these are people in their family or just in general they want to know? Well, they talk about their family members, but they also talk about it in general. And to me, that's also the mysterious nature of humanity, right? Yeah. That in the midst of this, we can have these ideas of hope. And we've been also very lucky that we have, um, through some of my associations, the um, Alexander Elkin, the gentleman I, I told you about, he um, read the works of Edie Eager. If those of you that don't know Edie, she's a psychologist. Uh, she lives in San Diego. She's 94. And she was, she's a Holocaust survivor. 
And Edie has written a, a number of books, but one of them is called The Choice. And she talks about um, the last time she sees her mother. And her mother was was going to be die, dying in the camps in the, in the, the horrible way that they killed um, Jews in, during those times. But her mother looked at her and said, remember, they can never take away what's in your mind. And, um, and so we were able to get Edie to come. And Edie um, talked for 15 minutes to the Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. And she gave the most inspirational thing about having hope in the midst of despair. And I think that we've had collaborations with our colleagues like that. If you haven't seen Edie speak, um, you can also go on our Trauma Resource Institute page. We have reposted her, her 15 minute talk. And I have to say that's inspiring. And that's inspiring to people that are living in war to think if she survived Auschwitz, can they survive mm -hmm. what they're going through? So I think when we um, give those little smatterings of ideas and what's on the other side yeah. it's something to hold on to and you know and, and at the same time i don't want to give people the idea you know that it's that the people are suffering greatly and there is i've seen a bit more hopelessness of late in some of the questions because of what i mentioned earlier is because it's going on longer yeah so let's talk a little bit now about all that you've learned with this experience can, where you can see taking it and where the larger therapy community could take it. Like we, we, we talked about inner cities where there's still violence on a regular basis. Can we take it there? Can we think about expanding whoever is in your network internationally to doing a similar kind of thing? You no, know, absolutely. I was thinking, I was talking to someone, I just came back from um, Northern Ireland where I talked at a trauma summit. And so I met many people internationally from different parts of the world. And, and I talked a little bit about this. Um, I was speaking there about some other subject as well. But I think that we do need to take a deep dive. I would love to create, wouldn't it be something, maybe Psychotherapy Network can do this, Lauren, is create um, a, a, a conclave of those of us that are interested in this idea. Because mm -hmm. now that we have this paradigm shift, even this talking on Psychotherapy Network right now, right? I'm in California. Where are you? <laughs> you're not in California. No, I'm in D.C. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. right. You're in D.C. So we have this opportunity to be able to think about how we provide support to our global community during times of oppression. And, you know, how do we go about doing that? And I think if we put our heads together, and this to me is a paradigm shift, because many times, and many of you who've done disaster work, they say, oh, we don't go in in the beginning. They need all the resources for rebuilding. I've been to the aftermath of hurricanes and floods and fires and mass shootings. But this is different. And I think we need to think about how we do that in terms of when there's conflict, but even more so, how do we create um, a cadre of people throughout our country, throughout the world, that are already prepared with wellness skills so it says a prevention strategy. And many of us, you know, whether it's trauma-informed yoga, whether it's the community resiliency model skills, whether it's uh, mindfulness, the different things, because we know that not every single one works with every single person. But if we have menu options, like a smorgasbord mm -hmm. that we can offer, and I'm like, I'm really curious about this EMDR um, light, whatever it is, because I'm going, oh, I know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm trained in EMDR. I know that it works very well. But if we can put it in the hands of the common person, and I think that's the also the, the thing when you're talking about learning. So the people in ed camp that I met were not therapists. They were teachers. Right. And yet they had in their hands, and I often talk about the natural leaders that live in every community. And there's many natural leaders that have not been trained like we all have in trauma therapies, but know how to support people when they suffer. And but what if we give them additional tools based mm -hmm. on neuroscience mm -hmm. that they can actually take? And when there is a crisis in their community, they can say, ah, tell me the moment that you survived. Yeah. And they notice the breath and say, did you notice you took a deeper breath? That's, re that's reinforcing the nervous system coming back into alignment. And we know, like, you know, when I think about the work of um, Dr. Richard Davidson from the University of Wisconsin, he talks about these resiliency circuits that we have and that we are not only were designed, sadly, of course, to remember, not sadly, but maybe importantly, the traumas that we've had in our life, but also that we can cultivate our well-being. Mm -hmm. What if we spent more time doing that?
-hmm. if we went to the places that are our hardest hit throughout the world. Because yeah. I think a lot of the divisiveness we see, whether it's here in the U.S. that we're seeing plenty of it right now, Northern Ireland that I just left, many people know about the civil war that's happened there, but that's from ages of historical trauma. There's undigested trauma in our world. And if we can help people show up as their best self, how could we change the world? I think we can. I mean, I'm, I'm really, I really feel like very, that's hopeful out of that is hopeful. horror. Yeah. Hopefulness out of horror. Elaine, we have a question from Catherine here that I'd like to ask. Okay. How do cases of survivors' remorse differ in wartime trauma from that um, of other traumas? Gosh, I don't know if it does differ. I mean, I think that, you know, I recall, you know, um, some of the sidebars I've had as well is that imagine being in a food line and half, the pe half your neighbors die and half of you survive. Mm -hmm. You know, the kind of the what if, you know, why, was, why did I survive? And I think that often is the question, right, as survivors. And certainly there's a much suffering that goes with that question. But also I've seen there's much uh, uh, well-being that goes with that question because sometimes people become such strong advocates and say, well, why did I live? What is my purpose? Mm -hmm. And you know, the more that I do trauma work, the more that I work in these kind of horrific situations, it's when people lose their purpose and meaning is when that sometimes they dive into those deep places of depression that feel like you can't get out of it. Mm -hmm. So I see sometimes the, the survivors can be remorse, but there can also be part of the process that there can be a remorse. And then there can be just like the phoenix rising from the ashes. There can also be a new renewed purpose. Now, it doesn't happen with every single person, but it happens with many. Mm -hmm. But oftentimes it's that person. It's like Edie can talk to those folks in a way that I can't because I didn't survive those kind of existential moments. But those, those individuals sometimes can pull people out of those dimensions of suffering and saying, well, maybe if Edie did it, maybe I could do it. Yeah. And, look at, and she's had a very purposeful life because if Edie was here, she'd tell you that it was an American soldier that pulled her out of a rubble of bodies mm -hmm. and she was alive. And she spent her professional life working at the VA in San Diego where she is a sacred, honorable, um, you know, beloved treasure of the planet. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, yep. Um, so I'm just thinking again about trauma specialists who are, their ears are pricking up with all the things that you're saying and they're yeah. taking it all in and they're thinking to themselves, I wanna do it, I wanna do it. Um, what do they need to plan for? What do they need to steal themselves for? Is there anything different? Do you feel like they need to be ready um, well, I think that trauma therapists, I guess, you know, many of us, you know, I had a very thriving private practice before I kind of devoted my work now to community work. And I saw many people individually that I imagine many people do that suffer. And I think that what we do individually, of course, is very important because we change one person who we guide changes the way they live in the world. Who knows how many people that impacts. But I guess I would encourage everyone to think about how do we be, how can we as individual, let's say, psychotherapists, you know, the Western approach is for emancipated individuals, but most of the world lives in community-based thinking. But how do we, how do we take what we know and be able to help our community? Maybe it's just our local community to start, to have an understanding of what we know that could possibly help prepare when the unspeakable happens. I mean, how could I not mention Uvalde right now and those the 19 children that lost their lives? I mean, what, three weeks ago, they were children living their lives with their families and all of a sudden now everything is turned upside down. Okay. Um, I know the weekend after Uvalde, I think there were 13 mass shootings in the United States. So how do we, how do we deal with that? You know, the Supreme Court today in the U.S. has just said we have the right to carry guns. I'm, I'm definitely, I'm not against carrying guns um, in terms of the, having the right to have guns. But I do worry about a society that has guns so readily because we know if we get into those hyper aroused states, right. even have a colloquialism, well, he lost his mind for a moment, right? And do, do something that changes not only your life, but someone else's life. Mm -hmm. I think that if we can, as trauma therapists, help not only the individuals that are coming, but think about, do I have some extra time that I might be able to engage in community work 
I think that's something we all should do, uh, you know, a deep dive and a listen to. Yeah. Yep. Elaine, thank you so much. Um, and thank you everybody for your participation. People were here from all over the country and all over the world. We appreciate you being here. We even had um, someone visiting from Ukraine. You sent us your best. I see that. I see that. And, you know, I just want everyone to know, go to Ed Camp Ukraine Facebook page. It has many, if you look, uh, click videos, you can see many of our offerings if you want to see some of the work that we've done. And um, also, I just want people to be able to contact me through the Trauma Resource Institute. If you just go to our website, it has a way to send me a message. Um, so people can do that if they have some ideas. Um, I'm always really open to hear how we can, as a community, um, create a world that doesn't isn't affected so much by these horrific events that happen. Um, I just, Beto just uh, asked if we can please save this live. This will be saved, Beto, yep. And you'll also be able to see it again on your feed. Um, and you can visit psychotherapynetworker.com. Uh, it will be there along with um, Elaine's article. Um, yes. It's up on the website. Um, oh, can I just say one more thing too? Because yeah. someone from from Austria asked me if they could um, could translate the article into German. And so now it's also translated into German Right. on this page that they have your link to as well. But I want to let people know that, um, that it has been translated into German as well. Great. Yes. And anybody here who's from an international community and wants to do that, just be in touch. And we're always happy to help with those uh, translations as well from our side. Elaine, this has been so topical and so great to hear about. And it is very hopeful that we can do this kind of work while people are, are in the midst of all of this. So thank you yes. so much. Oh, well, thank you so much, Lauren. And any, you know, anytime, please feel free to reach out to me. Thanks, everyone. All right.